Good morning, everyone. Welcome to my presentation. I'm going to tell you something about my TM journey and the benefits from technology management. Well, my technology management journey started with my, uh, you know, uh, started way, way back 1995 when I was still uh, an employee of the university. Fortunately, I was able to be granted a scholarship by the World Bank and, of course, the USD to be one of the recipi recipients of the World Bank scholarship to undergo the training in technology management. But with, with, with that situation, from 1995 to 1997, I would like to thank my professors who have uh, made my journey to this technology management paradigm. First of all, th this is Dr. Graham Chataway. He was my advisor for my special project, and uh, he was uh, very important in uh, honing me in my skills in the social aspect and economic aspects of technology management. Dr. Bromworthy is actually also my advisor, and he was very important in honing me in terms of the technical aspects of technology management. And the other one is Dr. Shanta Linage. Dr. Linage was very important also in terms of pursuing me to be inspired uh, that technology management is part of the economic paradigm and the social paradigm of the world. Okay, here's my, uh, a picture of mine uh, with some of my classmates there. And basically, uh, you know, in technology management, we, we are a global uh, school. And basically, we have uh, students from Japan, from Australia, and different sorts of situation. And here's a typical uh, morning uh, cup of tea with my advisor, Dr. Graham Chataway. Okay? And of course, at the end of the day, after uh, years of success and of course, uh, sometimes failure, you're, you're rewarded for the situation that you are now a graduate of technology management. So friends, and a lot of uh, peers were very important in my journey to be successfully, to successfully finish the MTM program, okay? And of course, at the end of the day, I have to go back to the Philippines. Unknowingly, at that point in time, I was really uh, apprehensive or more or less, uh, uh, not really that scared, but actually, uh, I was wondering who would accept or who would uh, really appreciate technology management in our country. So with that, my journey begins now. So let's start first with technology management. What is technology management? Okay, now there are a lot of definitions about technology management, but one of the definitions that we can see is that, for example, in the US National Research Council, uh, they, they think that technology management or MOT links the disciplines of engineering, science, and management disciplines to plan, develop, and to implement technological capabilities to shape and accomplish the strategic and operational goals of the organization. If you look at that statement, it's a little bit uh, very general. Now, those uh, points are actually uh, embedded in some three important points in technology management. The first one is value creation for investors. Technology creates value for the investors. Second one is the development of technological capabilities. With technological capabilities, you're able to implement or deploy these technologies in terms of products and processes. Other than that, MOT is actually linked to the cor corporation's uh, other management activities such as marketing or manufacturing. Now, some of the criticism about this definition regarding uh, the U.S. National Research Council's definition, Bayraktar gave a broader definition in, during the 1990s. Though. For him, MOT is a rational and systematic view of responding to technological opportunities and innovations and dealing with their consequences. If you look at the definition, Here's some of the critic which Bayraktar has actually uh, included. First of all, technology for him is creating new technologies and using existing technologies effectively and efficiently. Second one, technologies must respond and cope with the impacts and effects of technological change on the individuals, organization, society, and nature. And moreover, there are methods or techniques and procedures for dealing with technological issues and problems. Now, in Europe, they have this definition about MTM, or technology management. For them, it addresses the effective identification, selection, acquisition, development, exploitation, protection of technologies, product, process, and infrastructure needed to maintain a market position and business performance in accordance with the company's objective. So from that point of view, the EITM, or the European Institute of Technology Management, has actually embedded these themes, that there is a link between technology resources and the company's objectives in vital importance to the continuing challenge to many firsts. 
Moreover, technology management for them requires a number of management processes, including identification, selection, acquisition, exploitation, and protection of technology. Okay, so here, I'm going to show you a diagram on technology management. If you look at this diagram, we can see that there is a bigger environment, the organization, and within that organiza organization, we see a lot of situations. The strategy, innovations, and operations. If you look at this, there's going to be a circular mode there in terms of how the inputs are actually converted by the firm in terms of the technological perspective and the commercial perspective. If you look at that situation, the firm must need to interact with a lot of situations in the company in such a way that the inputs will now be transformed into something much more of value. Value for the organization and value for the environment. Now, Dunbar suggested that technology management encompasses this uh, definition. For him, it's all about management activities associated with procurement of technology, with research, development, adaptation, and accommodation of technologies in the enterprise, and the exploitation of technologies for the production and goods and services. As you can see, Dunbar is more or less moving towards the production of goods and services. Now, 2001, a unique definition was offered by Narayanan. If you look at this diagram, we see that uh, the questions about what, the purpose, and the how. If you look at this definition, for him, it focuses on the principles of strategy of the organization involving technology choices, guided by the purpose of creative value for investors. Competitive advantage, for him, is the key to the long-term value creation. It is thus the major objective behind management of technology. So basically, it's a long-term value creation. With value creation, you have uh, put that technology strategy, which is what the purpose now goes for the value-driven, and technology choices also is part of the purpose. At the end of the day, the organization must actually know how to integrate all of this situation in order for them to create the value that they create. Now, in 2005, a unique definition was offered by Hans Tam Hain. For him, TM is recognized as a core competency, critical to the survival and growth of virtually every enterprises. It includes to some extent the creation of new technology, but in most situations, it focuses on the application of technology towards creation, improvement of products and services, and the enhancement of business processes toward more effective, faster, more agile, and more socially acceptable operation. The definition is actually embedded now on the corporation's products and processes and services. The whole point there is that there's a new word there, effective, faster, and more agile, meaning that technology, it's like a race. The more effective you are, the more faster you are, the more agile you are, you are becoming more socially acceptable in terms of your operations. Now, for him, Hans uh, Taiman, management of technology can broadly define as the art and science of creating value by using technology together with other resources of an organization. So for him, it is the value creation, the value you create using technology with the resources of the organization. Now, Ericsson's definition, on the other hand, is all about this. TM addresses the effective identification, selection, acquisition, development, protection of technologies needed to maintain a market position and the business performance in accordance with company's objective. So here, this definition is much more now focused on the market and the business performance. And basically, technology management is very effective in terms of its uh, purpose to identify and select, acquire, and develop the technologies for the firm. Now, on the other hand, uh, White and Bruton criticize some of the definitions of technology management. For, it is, uh, for them, it lacks attention to evaluation and control which are required for strategic approach in the management of technology. For them, technology management has to be have control, evaluation, monitoring to ensure that it meets desired outcomes. At the end of the day, for them, technology is implemented. The firm must also monitor changes that may render the technology obsolete, dangerous, replaceable, and competitively weak. So if you look at their definition, their criticism is that technology has a life cycle, technology has an ending. On the other hand, again, White and Bruton uh, encompasses that MOT is the linking of many different disciplines to plan, develop, implement, monitor, and control 
technological capabilities to shape and accomplish the strategic objectives of the firm. So at the end of the day, let's see. For them, it was led to Tariq Khalil's definition. At the end of the day, for them, for Tariq Khalil, it is a knowledge concerned with the setting and implementation of policies to deal with technological development, utilization, and the impact of technology on society, organization, individuals, and nature, and aims to stimulate innovation, create economic growth, and to foster responsible use of technology for benefits of humankind. Tariq Khalil's definition now added the human factor in this definition, meaning that TM is actually an endeavor of humanity. And of course, we credit one of the definitions to the father of technology management in the Philippines, Dr. Roger D. Posadas in 2005. Let us look what he was thinking about technology management. For him, it is interdisciplinary. The study and management practice concerned with strategic, operational, as well as holistic identification, assessment, forecast, audit, benchmarking, selection, planning, generation, invention, protection, transfer, commercialization, innovation, acquisition, adaptation, implementation, development, application, learning, mastery, leapfrogging, and diffusion of technologies for the purpose of achieving and advancing an organization's or nation goals and objectives. As you can see, Dr. Posadas was actually putting all the definitions there, putting a lot of aspects in this definition in the year 2005. And this was actually, from his point of view, that the country is about to enter the world of technology management. So at the end of the day, if you look at technology management, technology management is interdisciplinary. With all those definitions from, from its beginning to now, and more or less in the past recent years, technology management is a field. It is an interdisciplinary field. Engineering is there, natural science is there, social science is there, industrial practice is there, and business administration. Link them, link them all together, it is actually technology management in this day and age. Okay, now let's now proceed. How big is the scope in managing technology? How big is this? How big is this paradigm? Let's take a look. Okay, if you look at technology management, there's a phenomenon known as R&D management. It is a field. So technology management, it is not just R&D management. Now, there's another field known as engineering management. Again, technology management is not just engineering management. Now, take a look. Another situation is that you can manage information, research, development, manufacturing, or the activities of scientists and engineers. Well, that looks good, but actually, again, technology management is not just managing them or managing these paradigms. But if you look at the further situation about technology management, technology management is concerned with the integration of various technology-related functional activities into a system and management of the system as well as its component activities. So it is actually uh, wide in scope in terms of looking at the different uh, fields that have already intruded technology management. Now, let's take a look at engineering management. Engineering management started as a formal discipline in 1940s. It was recognized as a profession in the Engineering Management Society. What it was formed in 1963 as part of the newly organized IEEE. Engineering management focuses more exclusively on the operation aspects of the firm and more specifically on managing an engineering environment. So if you look at that definition of, of engineering management, it is all about how actually the firm is actually more or less uh, creating technologies. Okay? Now, EM also, or engineering management, deals with the application of engineering principles and organizational and people skills to the delivery of engineering-based results. It leads now to the, uh, the situation, despite it is better established theoretical framework, and engineering management is now being considered as a subset of TM because TM covers virtually all facets of the enterprise while EM focuses on the firm's operation. MOT, or technology management, now involves the management of engineering, natural science, and social sciences. And if you look at the situation, admissive science, or planning, decision-making, development, and implementation of technology is also MOT. Development of operational capabilities, such as manufacturing, distribution, and field services, again, is also MOT. And operational processes, tools, techniques, and people who make it happen is also MOT. Moreover, MOT involves guidance and leadership. You produce leaders in the field of technology management. And leads now, that, that guidance and leadership leads now to the creation of business strategy, 
organizational cultures, and the business environment. Furthermore, MOT is actually interdisciplinary and the components are actually being integrated into a whole system. It also involves managing the system as a whole. Now, there are two major concerns of technology management at the firm level. So let's take a look at the company. The company is actually, in terms of DM, you are managing the generation, development, protection, exploitation, commercialization, and diffusion of technology. So in the firm level, how do you generate technology, exploit this, commercialize this, and you know, diffuse this is again a major concern of technology management. Moreover, we have the asset management, selection, acquisition, adaptation, learning, mastery, mastery and replacement of externally sourced technology. So, technology inside the company and technology outside the company is part of technology management. Now, let's take a look at the major concerns of TM at the national level. These are the questions at the national level which sometimes are being asked if you are doing technology management. First one, technology choices. The, if the country, no? What, what if the country is asked to, what types of technology should the country acquire? You know that the Philippines have already acquired a lot of technologies or a lot of countries acquire different kinds of technology. So that is the first question, technology choices. Second one, technology acquisition methods. Can we have this technology for our country or for other countries? How should the country acquire its technologies? This is a very uh, broad question, but actually this question it's very important because the acquisition of technologies is a complex situation. Now, this diagram tells us that we can see that strategic and operational focus can be seen in technology management and side by side with the macro level and the micro level. So in this diagram, we can say that strategic management at the macro level is actually something like this. For the macro level, if you, form, uh, if you formulate national s and strategies, Policies and roadmaps, that is actually at the macro level and that is strategic management in focus in TM. Now, if you have the micro level formulation of a firm's technology strategy and roadmap, that is at the micro level or the firm level, but take note, again, it is also strategic in sense. Now, moving on to the other side, operational management focus. The intersection of that with the macro level is that in this situation, the scope is development and management of national innovation system and SMT programs. So for example, in the Philippines, how DUSD creates national programs for science and technology, its scholars, its public scientists, technology acquisition is actually considered at the operational management at the macro level focus. Now, on the other hand, if you have the micro level and the operational management focus, you are now dealing with management of technological innovation and technology acquisition. So in the, in, the, in, the, in the end, if you look at this uh, matrix, strategic, operational, macro and micro level, you can see the intersection and what is or what are the things that are being done uh, or rather what, the, what are the scope being done at that, those levels. Okay, now let's now go to the managerial concerns of technology management. Technology management actually produces managers. It creates managers. So what are the concerns if you're going to be a technology manager? Now, at this level, this concerns about the managerial uh, situation is that it includes a wide range of increasingly common managerial concerns. The, your conditions are actually governed by a lot of situations as a manager. Creation of technological innovations and new products. As you can see, TM leads now you to create innovations and new products. In this situation, R&D is very important for managing new product development. Managers also manage the adoption of new technologies. Example, IT, making large process changes, managing uh, MIS implement, implementation projects. These are again also part of the managerial concerns of TM. And on the other hand, management is actually leading you to be confronted by new technologies. So this is actually all about change, conflict management, re-engineered and downsized companies are actually being changed by technology. Now, if you look at this uh, situation again, uh, problems in the business, all about in innovations, the processes, the suppliers, what type of business, what type of customers you are actually serving. Uh, let's say, for example, you're using the digital space, etc. Again, this is the concern of the manager of technology. Business skills are also important because business skills are part of your problem solving, negotiation, and of course, the business skills leads you towards your alliances 
and building reward systems that motivate, motivate technologically sophisticated employees like scientists and engineers. Now, if you look at this diagram here, we can see a lot of uh, situations here, but uh, this will just tell us tell you that the concern is at the micro level. And also this diagram. Okay. Now, where can you find the practice of technology management? Where are we there? Where can you see your technology manage managers doing their uh, skills or their uh, uh, expertise. Let's a, take a look at the micro or firm level. Now, at the micro or firm level, the technology manager is concerned with technology audit. What is technology audit? It means that you are actually trying to audit or you're trying to see where is this company heading? Is this company going uh, great? Is this company going uh, slow? So what are the technologies there in such a way that they are making uh, uh, more or less uh, uh, changes or making good results or some technologies are already becoming obsolete or becoming redundant. So technology audit scans your company or scans your firm in such a way that at that level you will see what technologies are there and what technologies are you using and what technologies are becoming obsolete or what technologies are now not being uh, used efficiently. Firm level technology management also leads you technology benchmarking. Company A, Company B. What technologies are being used by Company A? What technologies are being used by Company B? So a lot of companies are not, now are trying to benchmark themselves with other, other companies here and abroad because technology benchmarking is another aspect of firm level technology management. Now, intelligence is actually not spying. Okay? You are not actually spying other companies' uh, technology. But rather, technology intelligence is a, in some sort, uh, you are trying to have some sort of a business intelligence regarding to what the other companies are trying to create. But of course, there are a lot of ethical issues in technology intelligence. Okay? And of course, there are some issues that are actually not even resolved. For example, some companies are able to get technology from other companies and they are able to reverse engineer that. So this will be discussed uh, further on in some of the fields in technology, acquisition, and assimilation. Now, one of the micro-level functions of the technology manager is technology forecasting. Forecasting is a little bit on that side of prediction, but prediction is actually a little bit um, uncertain. So forecasting, in a sense, is that you're trying to predict what technologies are going to be in or out in the next few years. Forecasting is a must for the micro-level uh, situation because once you acquire technologies and you have not done a, a proper forecast or even a foresight with that technology, it might lead you to what technological failures and of course, it might lead you to losses in terms of you, your resources, your um, manpower, and even your technology might become irrelevant in the next few years. Okay, moving on, let's now go again to micro-level uh, technology management. Technology foresight is another way in which technology management intrudes the company. Foresight, on the other hand, is not about prediction. Foresight is about dealing with uncertainty in the long term. Foresight leads you now to different scenarios, different situations where your product, processes, manpower, technologies that are still in their pre-competitive stage will be very important if you acquire them or you adopt them. Technology foresight has been a practice in a lot of companies. A lot of companies have already uh, reaped the rewards of creating plausible scenarios, plausible products, plausible processes, and eventually they're able to see or more or less have a conjecture of the future uh, situation of their company's products and processes. Next one, again at the micro level or firm level, technology assessment. Technology assessment is actually, in a sense, very, very uh, tedious process because you are actually assessing the viability of the technology. It is like a feasibility study, but rather you are now trying to focus on the technological side of things for the company. And then, of course, you have strategizing. Strategizing mixed with the business strategy is very important. How are you going to pursue your research and development? And there is a thing known as R&D strategy. How are you going to pursue your acquisition? There are strategies in order for you to acquire technology. And how are you going to adapt to new technologies? So 
in a way, a lot of strategies have been uh, created by companies in such a way that they're able to adopt these technologies and eventually create new products and processes. And of course, at the end of the day, you should have a blueprint or some sort of a roadmap. So technology planning and road mapping is a very general term. But road mapping is very important because companies must make uh, some sort of a map in such a way that the proper way of you know, doing research and development, resources, manpower, uh, more or less uh, markets are very important in such a way that you're linking them and in such a way that these are actually linking together for a certain time that your product, processes, manpower are linked together for you to address a certain market. Much more than if you include the research and development aspect of your company so that they will be aligned at certain point in time, you're able to release the product or release the process and basically solve some of your problems as a company, okay? Okay, moving on, at the micro level, technology selection, acquisition, negotiation, and implementation. Again, some of these are well thought of by companies. Selection is very important. How are you going to select your technologies? How are you going to acquire and even negotiate in terms of how are you going to more or less uh, buy those technology, have some sort of a leverage with your suppliers, with your uh, competitors, etc. No? And basically, at the end of the day, implementation is very important. So see, at the micro level, a lot of things are actually being done in such a way that you need not be, you know, you need not be aware. You need to be aware that all of these processes are very important because they will lead you to the proper implementation of those technologies. Okay, and then, of course, at the micro level again, we talk about technology adaptation, replication, improvement, and replacement. So, adapt or be what? Uh, box out, replicate, or more or less you will be stuck with your technology or products. Improve or your products will just be uh, hitting some markets. It will not be... Uh, patronized by some of the market which are actually looking much more from your technologies and replacement there are certain technologies in your company that, that are actually needed to be replaced in such a way that if you're going to replace them you might be going to the efficient mode of your company to produce products and processes okay and then of course at the micro level research 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 is very important but actually Strategize, selecting a project for research, portfolio management, and project management is very important. Why do you need to go into research or even R&D? Research is very important because research is part of your come up to in such a way that if you have certain technologies in your company, they will not last for long. Research will do, be the one, they will be the one feeding your technology in such a way that they might come up with new innovations because other companies are actually might be looking at your company also and they, they might be also trying to strategize a research and development program for your, for your product to be boxed out sooner or later. Now, at the macro level, so we have just reached the macro level now. Uh, previously, it was the micro level. What is the macro level? The macro level is much more or less something like this. Okay. It is all about the, the nation, okay, and even international situation. So in technology management at the macro level, it is much more uh, holistic in a sense. So here, you're de dealing with s and be benchmarking, science and technology benchmarking. For example, in the Philippines, how are we compared in terms of our R&D? research and development budget, our, the level of technology that we have in our country, in agriculture, in manufacturing, in um, other natural sciences, in pharmacy, no? So basically, if you have certain companies which, or rather countries who already have up there and you are still down here, s and benchmarking is very important as a technology management paradigm at this level. National technology foresight, again, is very important. We have a foresight in the company, but this time you're dealing with foresight at the macro level, the national level. Foresight leads the companies in such a way that if there is a national technology foresight plan, the companies around or the, ecos the companies in the ecosystem will be very much alive in a sense that they will be more or less be part of the stakeholder. They will be part of you know, developing uh, products that the national government or the national, the nation supports. 
For example, is there room for a new source of uh, energy for the country? What is the national foresight for solar power? It, uh, can we still uh, have a national foresight for nuclear power plants? Can we have a national foresight for uh, going to space applications or space uh, level applications? Okay, so national foresight is very important in, sense, in the sense that it is holistic, you know. The country is actually being seen by a lot of stakeholders and what technologies are needed, what technologies are needed and what technologies should be supported for future understanding and future applications. Moreover, macro level includes also national s and strategy formulation. The Philippines, for example, what is the strategy now of the country? What is the national s and strategy of the country? Remember, we have some balik scientists. Was that, is that considered a national s and strategy? Yes, it is considered a national s and strategy. We're able to you know, bring back our national scientists or some of our foreign scientists who are Filipinos back into our country and they're able to help our people in order for them to be guided in, ter in terms of their scientific and technological applications. So national s and strategy is very important because it leads the nation what technologies are we going to more or less bet on? Not really bet on, but rather what technologies are we going to support, we're going to fund in such a way that these technologies will be part of our industrial applications or industrial paradigms. Also at the macro level, national R&D policy formulation is very important. In the Philippines, for example, how many percent of the GDP is actually uh, you know, put into R&D. So we have a certain percentage of our GDP or more or less our budget to uh, be placed in research and development. Through the years, I think in the Philippines, it was so little, but you know, at a very some point in time, our uh, scientists, our uh, national um, our secretaries, our people are actually looking at science and technology and therefore they were, they were able to formulate policy in terms of putting much more money in research and development, putting money or incentives into research and development incentives in terms of taxes, and basically the creation of a lot of R&D centers in the Philippines, okay? Now, macro level also leads now to national R&D portfolio formulation. What do you mean by this? Uh, R&D portfolio formulation is something like this. You are leading your country, what are the the, the portfolio or what are the, 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 the branches or what are the fields that our nation is actually investing on? How much money are we putting in that? How much resources? How many scientists are going to be involved in that? What universities, what private companies are going to be involved in a national R&D portfolio? So that is very important for us because whatever we do with R&D, the R&D actually fuels our innovative, innovative capability. And at the end of the day, you cannot do R&D without <coughs> money. National R&D budgeting is very important because this is, uh, this is the money that is actually collected from a lot of donors here and abroad. And actually, part of our taxes are being poured into the national R&D budget. So this is very important because R&D is a very expensive endeavor for the country. So where, do, where will we get our budget for this? It is very important the country has a continuous flow of budget for research and development. For our products, our R&D, uh, the products that we have derived from R&D becomes now future uh, products through innovation. And innovation is fueled by research and development. Okay? So, at the macro level also, technology management is involved in management of R&D mission projects, national R&D impact assessment, and national innovation policy formulation. Let's take a look at R&D mission projects. Now, we have just uh, entered the space age. In fact, the Philippines has just entered the, the space race, and we have already launched, I think, uh, some satellites out there up in space, and basically these satellites are going to be part of our uh, strengths in such a way that Maybe in the long run, this program will be conducting missions also in outer space or in some parts of the world or in some parts of the Philippines in such a way that we can assess the different geographical or even the weather situation of our country. Okay? 
National R&D Impact Assessment is very important once again because this is where you see where the R&D budget has uh, been poured and basically what are the products of research and development, how are they impacting or what, are, what is the impact of this, uh, the products of research and development. Just like for example in the, in the country, we have devoted some money on uh, natural products or more or less uh, uh, medicinal products from our botanicals, uh, botanical supplies or botanical uh, resources in our country. For example, we have the uh, Lagundi. So where is the Lagundi now? It is now considered to be one of the medicine for your cough. And you know, the, 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 the country funded this project in such a way that now it is part of your uh, daily medicine in terms of you know, relieving your cough. So just imagine the impact of this uh, medicine in such a way that it has more or less, uh, not really replaced, but there is an alternative uh, more or less a reasonably priced cough medicine for our people. And that is the impact of a national R&D scheme. So we can study a lot of R&D situation in the country and which can have impact later on. And of course, National Innovation Policy Formulation or NIS, if we want to have a national innovation system, how can we put our country in a sense that how is, what is the innovation ecosystem in the country? Where will we get our R&D, our people, our budget, and our resources? So there has to be a policy in such a way that science and technology must be managed in such a way that the innovation ecosystem is alive, not only now, but in the future. Okay, and of course, at the macro level, you can have a lot of uh, management level at the national innovation system, regional innovation system, sectoral innovation system, and development of technological innovations. In a nutshell, this macro level management, these four uh, systems here, is actually again from the nation to the region and even to the different sectors. So the agricultural sector, the industrial sector, the manufacturing sector, the pharmaceutical sector. Uh, what else? Uh, do you have the, the aquaculture sector? These are again, uh, must be developed in such a way that the macro level analysis of this is very important in order for us to develop programs in terms of science and technology inclusion. Okay, and then of course, macro level includes national technology gaps, technology catch up, and of course, a lot of goals and strategies. So what are the gaps? Where is the Philippines now? What are our gaps? Where are we going to put our money, our R&D resources, and how are we going to manage that? We are actually, you know, leading in some of the technologies. What technologies are we leading at? Are we lagging some technologies? And what are these technologies? So it is very important at this level, the macro level, it's very important because some of these technologies are going to be expensive. And some of the technologies uh, we might not even acquire. So in terms of this macro level situation, the gaps must be addressed in such a way that we can have alternative technologies in our country in such a way that we can no longer, we can have alternative technologies so that our uh, people can buy this technology. For example, let's take, for example, the, the arms industry, guns, missiles, okay? So protection, this military, mi military technology, uh, how, how long are we, or more or less, what is the scope of these technologies? Are we going to bet on this or are we going to put money on this in such a way that uh, these technologies need to be upgraded for our armed forces. That again is also at the macro level situation. Besides military, how about space technology? How about agricultural technology? So all of this different sector needs to be understood or analyzed in such a way that where are the gaps there and how are we going to catch up on this? Okay, and then of course, uh, the application of technology management can now be look at the meso level. The meso level is all about the industry. So here, we will just be analyzing different sectoral technology roadmaps. No? For example, agriculture technologies, defense technologies, information ICT, information communication technologies, health technologies, energy technologies, and transportation technologies. If you look, look at the situation, sectoral technology roadmaps are actually or must be done in such a way that this roadmaps is actually is a, our management tools or management situations that our technology managers can create and actually be guided for policy thinking. 
Okay, so here are examples of what the technology managers are doing at the meso level or the industrial level. First one, we have the industry analysis, sometimes value chain analysis. What is a value chain? Well, simply, it's all about making the product from A to point B. But the value chain is so vast. You have the primary activities, you have the secondary activities. So what are these things in, the, in your industry that actually puts value to your product or your processes? Actually, technology management is actually part of this. If you look at the value chain now, they are already technology intensive. Every part of the value chain is technology intensive in such a way that value creation is now being pushed by technologies. And then also at the meso level, you need to characterize the different industries. What are these industries? Are they sunrise industries? Are these industries here to stay long? Are these industries still at their infant stage? Are these industries already mature? Characterizing this industry is very important because you can get a grasp of the market and where technologies could be applied. And at the end of the day, the industry dynamics and evolution is very important. What is happening to the different industries? What about the agricultural industry in the Philippines? Are we still in the primary level of industry? Are we, are we going to the secondary, tertiary, or the quaternary level? So dynamics and evolution, let's say from the typical manpower, to extractive industries, to more or less mechanization and automation. Are, are these industries actually evolving now in that situation? Meso level analysis is very important. Okay, so moving forward, let's now take a look at some of the meso level application of TM. Again, we have here identification potential industrial clusters, formation and go governance of industrial clusters, and promotion development of industrial clusters. What are industrial clusters? Industrial clusters are very important in technology management because these are actually where you see the congregation of a lot of elements in the ecosystem where they form for part, contribute to each other, understand each other in, in such a way that they're able to produce products and services. We, we, we study here more or less industrial clusters of different countries, like, let's say Malaysia, Australia, Indonesia, and we, we can learn a lot from them. And in the Philippines, we have a lot of industrial clusters here in the country. We have the textile industrial clusters. We, have, we even have the food industrial clusters. We, we even have the agricultural industrial clusters. Now, having an application of technology management in these industrial clusters is very important in a sense that they can now be understood that how can we hone the talents, the resources of these industries in such a way they can produce quick products or more or less release their products quickly uh, in, in such a way that the different regions and even the whole country can benefit from this and basically we can even export the products of these industrial clusters. Okay, and then of course, in those industrial cl clusters, it is very important that policies, evaluation, analysis, and even the roadmaps for these industrial clusters are very important. I remember when uh, we created the technology roadmap for the electronics industry, it was very important in the sense that our electronics uh, giants or more or less our small medium enterprises were able to catch up on our contribution to the electronic industry of the country and into the export orientation. Okay, at the meso level also, we need to understand the, uh, the potentials of industrial clusters. Here we talk about the formation, governance, and even in the promotion and development of such industrial clusters. Industrial clusters have been here for a long time. In Malaysia, Indonesia, and Australia, a lot of industrial clusters were very important in propelling their technologies and products and services. Now, in the Philippines, we also have a lot of industrial clusters here. But understanding more or less the application of TM theories and concepts within, within these industrial clusters are very important in such a way that we can speed up or expedite the development of the products of these industrial clusters. Thus, a very important aspect of the meso level analysis of these industrial clusters is also the concerns of technology management. And also, formulation, evaluation, and road mapping for these industrial clusters are very important in such a way that each industrial clusters will know what direction of their technologies, what direction of their resources, their talents are going to be honed in such a way that the roadmap will be guiding them for a certain number of years in such a way that they will be productive and be part of the contribution of technology and innovations to national and even at the international level. 
And also, meso level uh, technology management includes technology parks and technology incubators. At this point in time, the Philippines is now moving into the era of technology incubation. I think DOSC has already funded 14 technology in incubators around the country from north to south. And these technology in incubators are evolving uh, because technology parks are there, but technology incubation is now the, the in thing for technology management because technology incubators are where you will see startups and basically technology-driven company, companies in such a way that they are addressing the needs of the local region and even the national uh, level and even some international applications. So technology management at this level, at this point in time, is very important because these are the powerhouses of innovations. Okay, so what benefits can the Philippines get from technology management? What can we do about technology management? How can we get a lot of uh, benefits from this paradigm? Let's take a look. Okay, take a look at this graph here. This is the S-curve. This is the well-known graph by Foster. As you can see, in the X-axis, we have the R&D efforts over time. And at the Y-axis, we have the performance. And each of these regions, we have the slow growth, rapid progress, and fully exploited. This S-curve is very important because this is where you see technology management can intrude. Slow growth, rapid progress, and fully exploited technologies can now be understood at this level. Even if you understand the different environmental factors or social factors, a must in understanding the nature of the S-curve is very important. So this Foster S-curve just tells us that the technological progress starts at slowly, then increases rapidly, and then tapers off as the physical limits of the technology are approached. So let's take a look. So see? S-curve is here. Performance parameter is at the Y, are the efforts over time. Take note, that graph, that S-curve is moving, moving and it will be reaching a natural limit. So what is the point of reaching that natural limit? Let's take a look. Okay, so here, if you look at the performance parameter here, at the X-axis, uh, we have the time. So the time tells us that R&D must be be included in your efforts for you to see the performance parameter stage one stage two stage three and stage four if you look at that situation every technology will reach a natural limit the new invention period will be at stage one rapid growth will be at stage two and maturity period at stage three aging period will be stage four the aging period is actually where you see sometimes the technology does not reach its natural limit so even though it does not reach its natural limit or it reaches its natural limit, that's a time already that maybe in stage one, stage two, or stage three, you must also include research and development efforts already. So here, so we have here expressing our, the beginning of the technology S-curve, Mathema mathematically suggests that new idea for improving a new technology will be proportional to an existing set of ideas in the beginning of the technology. So that is actually the natural limit. So take a look at this as S-curve again. We see as the early period of invention, it's in exp exponential form. Now let's take a look at this. The linear portion of the technology S-curve occurs when incremental improvements in the technology are being made. So as you can see, in that period there, the middle period technology, you can see some incremental improvements. Now, let's take a look at the technology life cycle in terms of market volume. We have already analyzed the S-curve. Now, setting up the S-curve here in this technology life cycle, what can we learn from this technology life cycle and how can this technology life cycle benefit our scientists, engineers, and our technology managers? As technology develops and penetrates the market, the variation in the number of its users over time will define the technology life cycle similar to the product life cycle. So we will be superimposing the technology life cycle here. So in this graph here, we see the market volume against time. As you can see, A is technology development, B is the application and launch, C is application and growth, and D is a technological maturity. Going down, you see technology substitution, and F is technology obsolescence. This graph tells us that if you are basing your developments on the S-curve, it is uh, worthy to note that how, whatever R&D efforts you are 
putting right now, it will be part of A, B, and C, and eventually D. So if you're going to put R&D efforts over technological maturity, that will be very important in the sense that you have to decide, are you still going to put R&D when the technology is already mature, or are you going to put technology or research and development during application or, or application launch and application growth? So now, as shown below, a technology may evolve along curve A or A prime, depending on the number of factors, including the type of technology itself and the cost and time devoted to the development of A. Newer technology based on different underlying physical phenomena will have a different S curve and a different rate, uh, range of performance for the same performance parameter. So let's take a look at the graph here. You see, we have the performance parameter and time, A against A prime. See, the limit is reached already by A, A in such a way that A prime is actually again reaching the limit of A. Now take note, even though you have research and development to A prime, the natural limit of the technology is still there. It is now time that you have to put a certain limit now or you reach up a certain limit. It's something like this. You are more or less leveling up the performance of the technology. In such a way, you have now a new S-curve, which is B, which is actually now having a new limit. So the technological parameters is now being uh, uh, overtaken by technology B. Now let's take a look at this concept known as technological discontinuities, jumping the S-curve. Take a look at this graph. When the new technology B begins to substitute for existing technology A, there appears a technological discontinuity, a jump to another S-curve. Notice that? That space there between A and B is known as a technological discontinuity. The incremental improvements in an existing technology A constitute the technological maturation. So basically, if you look at A, going to that S-curve, it has already reached its maturity. And therefore, that space between A and B is known as technological discontinuity. Now, whereas the radical breakthrough that produced the new technological technologies and threatened to offset existing technologies continue, technology evolution is happening now. If you look at that, you see now B is actually evolving now. In some case, drastic improvements in the new technology B are needed before it can make an existing technology A obsolete. In other cases, a breakthrough technology C may obsolete an existing technology from the very beginning. Notice another technology C is actually rising over the performance parameter of A, which has already reached its natural limit. And as you can see, the space between A and C is now the technological discontinuity. So C, you can have technological discontinuity from below the S-curve and technological discontinuity from above the S-curve. So therefore, technology evolution in terms of successive generation of technology tells us that evolution may be depicted in terms of series of S-curve, jumps as one technology is replaced by another generation of technology. Take a look at the graph there. Performance parameter against the time. As you can see, vacuum tubes, there's a new technology, transistors. Transistors has its natural limit. So here's another technology, integrated circuits. The integrated circuits has reached its uh, natural limit. There's a new curve, which is the integrated optics. So as you can see, that is technological evolution in terms of successive generations of the technology. Okay, so we just finished technological evolution. Now how about technological maturation? Technology maturation is depicted in this diagram here. So we have again the performance parameter over time. Stage one, stage two, stage three, stage, stage four. As you can see, this technology is going from stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four. In stage four, it is known as the aging period. The aging period tells us that that technology has already reached its natural limit. So at that point in time, before aging period, you see the maturity period. So basically, the technology is already maturing, meaning that it can still have its performance parameter improved, but take note that there is a natural limit for the performance of that certain technology. So this is actually the difference between technological evolution and technology maturation. Technology maturation is depicted by a technology S-curve, whereas the technology evolution previously is depicted by an S-curve with a different S-curve coming from below it or another S-curve above it reaching its natural limit 
or rather surpassing the natural limit of that uh, leader technology. So therefore now, we can see technological evolution in terms of successive generations of technology. It is actually depicted in terms of a series of S-curve jumps as one technology is replaced by the next generation of technologies. So here you go, vacuum tubes, transistors, integrated circuits, and could be optics or something like that. So if you look at this diagram, you can see that there is a jump actually from the previous S-curve. So this is now known as technological evolution. Technology S-curves were a complex technology with several sub-technologies. As you can see, each technology can have sub-technologies. The sub-technology S-curve of a complete technology shaped the latter's overall S-curve. For example, in the personal computer, it is a complex technology consisting of several sub-technologies. So we have the first technology there, the technology system S-curve, the red one. If you can see, there's another sub-technology S-curve. Subtechnology 2 S curve and Subtechnology 3 S curve. If you look at that situation, the technology system S curve is again moving towards a sigmoid uh, shape or S shape. But take note that Subtechnology 3 S curve has already reached the natural limit of technology system S curve. So here in this diagram, we see that technology S curves are a complex technology with several subtechnologies. So what can we learn from this technology S curves? There is actual opportunities here. If you look at the stages, this is where we can benefit from these S-curves. If we, look, we were looking at that, that technology, this is actually an opportunity for the Philippines to go into certain technologies that we are capable of or are we are building our R&D capabilities. So this is actually the benefits of understanding just one concept in technology management. Okay, what's the actual shape of technology trajectories for lighting technologies? Let's take a look at this example. The S-curve theory of technology evolution does not seem to conform actual historical or technical data, according to Sud and Tellis. No? If you look at this, it is like the concept of punctuated equilibrium. In, um, you know, uh, it, it is a theory in evolution that certain technologies will be there for a certain time. So let's take a look at this graph. We have incandescent lamp the arc discharge, the gas discharge, and the LED light emitting diode, and the microwave electrode discharge. As you can see, some of the technologies since 1879 are still here. For example, the incandescent lamp. We believe that the S curve for that has already reached its maturity. But take note, the incandescent lamp is still here. It was still around in 1990s, and even some of this lamp are still here. Let's take a look at the arc discharge. The arc discharge was actually between 1919 and 1939, the blue one. As you can see, it has moved forward and basically moving on in terms of its lighting efficiency as a parameter. And take a look, it has remained from 1959 to 1979 and basically uh, jumped actually its performance parameter from between 1979 and 1999. So this graph tells us again that the shapes of technology trajectories for lighting technologies are actually different for a different period of time. What can we have, what benefits can we have from this diagram here? This is again an opportunity for us that R&D is actually a very important endeavor for our country, research and development. This is just for lighting technology. How about other technologies? We can have agricultural technologies. Uh, military technologies, pharmaceutical technologies. So there is an opportunity for us to understand the different S-curves of certain technologies which have been there and which will be becoming obsolete. This is the opportunity which is given by technology management to us. Research and development is part of our strategy in order for us to make new innovations and to enter the world of creating technologies. Okay, again, let's take a look at the benefits of technology management. This, these are a few slides that I show to my students, which are actually uh, in, inspiring enough for, for them to see where technology management fits here. So let's take a look. This is the basic building blocks of the competitive equation. As you can see, we have around one, two, three, four, five. Yes, five boxes there. The first box there is the natural resources and raw materials. Second box are the products and process technology. The third box are the products and services. The fourth box are the integrator or applier systems technology. And take a look at the lead, uh, the end box there, it's a final customer. As you can see, you are actually competing in terms of this uh, building blocks. 
where can we now stand or more or less place our bets or place our situation in such a way that we can compete? Let's take a look. This is the competitive outlook of our resource companies. So the Philippines is an example of a country which is endowed with a lot of natural resources. Now let's take a look at this diagram here. Take a look at the natural resources and raw materials. So big that we have, let's say the Philippines has so many of this. Take a look at the products and process technology. Well, halfway through the products and services, halfway through the products and process technology, integrator applied system technology is also a little bit small. But take note of the final customers. They're small. So if you look at this situation, the competitive outlook for resources companies actually there, but take note the final customer are just few. But take note that getting or extracting natural resources is very important because this fuels the country's basic uh, blocks for food, uh, let's say agriculture, uh, uh, food, and other resources like uh, minerals, etc. No? So if you're going to become uh, more or less investing on resource companies, extracting natural resources and raw materials, these are the key competitive factors. Quality and management of resource base, Conversion efficiency, capacity utilization, effectiveness at discovery, and efficiency at logistics. What are these key competitive factors? Take a look. A, B, C, and D. These are again are very technology intensive. These competitive factors are very important in such a way that you can actually more or less uh, hone those competitive blocks in such a way that you can extract the natural resources and raw materials and convert them in such a way that you can have uh, um, greater capacity and eventually you can have more final customers there. So basically, if you're effective in discovery and efficient in logistics in such a way that the natural resources, you can actually make the final customer increase. So this is very important in terms of understanding technologies in these types of indices or resource companies. Let's go, let's go to the next. Okay. This one is the competitive outlook for the components-oriented companies. So companies that makes electronic components or components of other products. Now let's take a look at this. The natural resource and raw materials are more or less uh, minimal, but take a look at the in-betweens there. The products and the process technology must be great. So you can have products and services which are big or more or less a multitude number. The integrator applier system technology are not really that big. But take a look at the final customer. Again, that's big. If you look at this situation, this is a components-oriented company. It is very technology intensive. Why is that so? Let's take a look at the competitive factors. Take a look, proprietary technology, meaning that if you have certain technologies which are proprietary to you in order for you to create products and process, then you are the lead of the game. Production, performance, and features are very also are also important in such a way the products and process that you produce are actually unique in a sense that the customers will be looking at your products from a different point of view, thus increasing their absorption or their situation and even markets or other markets that can evolve from your products. The cost is also very important here. You have to reduce the cost in such a way that you can have, uh, you know, supply a lot of uh, big markets in such a way that you can make use of your capacity or make use of your technologies in order to produce a lot of, uh, or rather scale up your capacity. Breadth of product line, again, is very important in such a way that customers in the components-oriented companies have different notions or different uh, attitudes or different uh, unique properties or unique uh, requirements. So the breadth of product line is very important. Thus, you can increase your customers at the end of the day. Of course, reliability of suppliers are very important and post-sale services. Components-oriented companies at this point in time, if you look at this diagram, this is again the benefits where technology management plays a big role. A lot of these are technology-intensive activities in such a way that these companies are actually you know, making a big step in their operations, their sales, and even their quality. So these are the, component out, the competitive outlook of component-oriented companies, as seen by the technology manager. Okay, lastly, let's now take a look at this situation here. As you can see, this is now the system-oriented companies. These are the ones uh, that are required. These are technology-intensive in such a way that the final customer is so big, in such a way that you have to be really technology-intensive here. Natural resources and raw materials, 
very minimal, but take a look at the in-between competitive blocks. All about technology, products and process. The products of this uh, product and process technology are very important because they will be combined with the integrator and prior systems technology. Thus, those competitive blocks are, uh, must be abundant or must be reliable in such a way the final customer will have no reason for, you, for them to accept your technologies. So, these system-oriented companies can thrive in a very uh, in a manner in which uh, a lot of final customers are going to absorb their products and basically patronize their services. But the key competitive factors are there. Uh, serving application requirements, credibility with uh, customers, system integration, project management is there, cost-effective technologies, and compatibility or interoperability of product lines. Thus, this type of system-oriented companies in certain countries or in certain regions of the world can be competitive. And again, an analysis of this from the technology manager's point of view at the macro level or the meso level is very important. So there you, there you have it. These are the benefits that we can uh, you know, see that where technology management is actually harboring. Now, this is another situation in which uh, technology management can be seen. As you can see, organizations or firms are very important because they are the lifeblood of the indices. They produce technologies, products, and processes. As you notice, there are inputs and the outputs. Now, whatever the inputs there, could be financial, material, technology, information, etc. As long as they will be transformed inside the organization, and there's a system in which the organization is actually transforming this, you will have outputs, could be financial, good consequences, maybe sometimes bad consequences. But the whole point there is that transformation is very important in an organization. Analyzing the organization's internal strength and the organization's external environment for them to be, to, to be put into the inputs is very important. Thus again, here you'll see a lot of technology management principles being done here or being exhibited here in the transformation process. Now, technology management also deals with a lot of culture. Culture is very important. It's not just about technology, the hardware, the software, or even the research and development, but the culture of the company is very important. Technology managers are actually the one who are at the interface of the company's understanding of the culture of the company and even the culture outside the company. As you can see in this diagram, the company is faced with a lot of external culture. Universities, suppliers, financial bodies, research units, cultural services, unions, government, users, competitors. And of course, you can add more uh, there in the system culture. Thus, technology management is uh, there to understand its culture and therefore companies are there to understand what the technology managers assess and recommends in such a way that the companies will now flourish or can flourish in uncertain cultures. And of course, the company is what? It, it is not always a company with a vision and mission that is actually, you know, monumental. As time goes by, the firm actually changes. The firm's mission might change, the firm's mission might change a little, and the goals and the objectives might change also. So the firm is actually subjected with a lot of change sources. Again, the benefits of technology management is very important here because TM actually is where they interface between the firm and the change sources. Technology, laws, economy, reorganization, technology acquisitions, demographics, different types of people are moving to the firm, different races, regulations, uh, trade orders, uh, you know, uh, regulations with food, manufacturing, even gender issues, unions and globalizations, and even the competitive arena are actually changing the firm. So if the firm has no technology management uh, understanding of this, the firm can survive. But added attraction is that technology manager management is actually interfacing with the, with, within the firm and the change sources. Okay. So now, having said all those benefits with regards to technology management at the firm level, the industry level, and even at the national level, technology management has come a long way. And it is, I think, here to stay in the Philippines, especially that we are moving 
in this century and a lot of uh, startup companies are now uh, starting to uh, you know, sprout like mushrooms and these startup companies will become uh, future companies. They could be small, medium enterprises or big companies in the future. And technology management is here to stay because te the technology managers are interfacing with the internal, the external situation with regards to new technologies, new paradigms, and new concepts. But take note that technology managers have something in them, something not born with, but something acquired along the way. So, do you have what it takes to become a technology manager? Well, ask yourself, but here's a list for you to see that are you ready to go into the technology management paradigm? So again, technology management, the definition is that it is about integrating the business management with technical disciplines. This is the well-accepted situation that business is there and technical disciplines are there. So how can you marry these two? So at the end of the day, to become a technology manager, this is something you need. You will be uh, doing research, planning, developing, building, applying, installing products or services successfully for the customer. And you're going to form and achieve the strategic and operational objectives of the enterprise. So see, you are part of the growing enterprise. You are not just there as consultant, but rather you as a technology manager, the benefits, the industry, the country, you are now inter facing with the strategic and the operational level of these entities. So here is a diagram that tells us that technology management is the marriage or the union between technology and business. Technology is there, business is there, the field of technology management is growing, and it, has, it is still here, it is uh, staying, it is growing. In fact, a lot of universities are opening up their technology management and even changing it from technology and innovation management technology and innovation and business management. So as you can see, the whole idea about technology and business is there. It is masticated in the sense that even though we are changing its name, the whole point that there is that technology management is the baseline for the understanding of these paradigms. These are your must-haves as technology managers. These are your requirements. Do you have a focused goal? Technology management is all about focus. You may be attracted with a lot of situations, but at the end of the day, technology has a purpose. Technology has a goal. So as a technology manager, what is your purpose in promoting the technology to the business? And that is a very important aspect of the technology management paradigm. The focus goal is always there. Next one, strategic directions. Strategy is all about Taming the uncertain nature of business, the uncertain nature of geographic landscapes, economic landscapes. That is the work of technology management. Strategic directions, not only for the short term, but for the long term. Next one, technology transfer and acceleration capability. Of course, technology managers need to have at least an understanding of the technology. Certain technologies like biotechnology, information technology, and other technologies which are actually now, if you will just uh, browse to the internet, do you know, you know how it works, how they're built. As a technology manager, you know where these technologies are, go are going to, who's going to benefit from this technology. How are you going to transfer it in a faster way for the company or the entities to have more or less, uh, you know, reap the rewards of this technology transfer. Next one. Business and technology mixed together comes up with technology management. And take note that business is an enterprise. So you must have an entrepreneurial and management thinking. You are not alone in this world as a technology manager. You are not isolated. You are talking to entrepreneurs. You are talking to businessmen. You are talking to scientists. All in all, you're trying to put them all together and have the entrepreneurial thinking, entrepreneurial mindset that science and technology has a certain value at the end of the day. Of course, you should also have a methodology or understanding of technology assessment, forecast, and foresight, which are fields in technology management of understanding what the technology is inside the company 
or what the technology can be acquired by the company, the future of this technology, its performance, and even the future scenarios which this technology can catapult the companies or the enterprises to new heights in terms of applications, new markets, and new paradigms. And of course, a situation in which you must understand how technologies are implemented in the company. And that the rest are there, tools and techniques to shorten the product development cycle. Just we have thought, uh, uh, discussed about the S-curve, that R&D can make the product development cycle shorter. Effectiveness in managing managers and technical professionals. And capability to conduct large complex projects which employ many disciplines. So, are these must-haves in you? Well, basically, they're not in you, but along the way, you will be acquiring them through the understanding of technology management theories and paradigms. And these are very important for you to see the business context of things, the technological context of things, and the innovation context, context of things. So, technology managers, you will be amazed because you are not alone this, in this world. You will have bosses. You might be the boss, and you will have uh, uh, more or less uh, subordinates. There are different models of management that you will be encountering. You, you will be encountering. There are authoritarian style, laissez-faire style, management labor, and participative. Just take a look at this situation. You, as a technology manager, need to understand these types of models of management because if you will be, you know, uh, be wary about one mo uh, management style, you might end up as a technology manager, which is not a leader, but rather as a follower. You might be ending as a follower, but supposed to be you are a mediator between the business and the technology. So this will be encountered, you will be encountering a lot of uh, styles of uh, management in the company, in the industry, and even in the national arena. Okay? So technology managers, Traditional business and emerging business, if you look at this diagram, we see that traditional situation is still existing as of now. Emerging styles of business organization are already here. But after 1990s, we are entering the digital age. So if you look at this, people, process, technology, markets, and management, they have changed through time, especially now. Uh, where we are now in the 21st century and a lot of things are there. So we might be looking at people which are not only educated, sophisticated, but multi-educated, multi-sophisticated, multi-career. We can see the process no longer simple and physical, but rather now it's digital, it's collaboration, much more complex. A lot of uh, multi-intellectuals are there to understand process. Technologies can no longer mecha be mechanical or more or less mechanistic view. Uh, we have entered already the electronic and biological organic view. Uh, technology is now what? Technology is at your fingertips already. It's in the internet. It's already in part of everybody's life. We are a social network-driven society. So these technologies must be used or more or less must be adopted by technology managers. Organizations now are immersed in a different market. Before, markets were stable and uh, supplies were stable. Then they move into fluid markets and the supplies become fluid also. But nowadays, the markets are much, not really that fluid, but rather a lot of markets are now emerging. Just imagine new flavors of chocolates. Chocolates, which are actually chocolates, and chocolates which now taste like, you know, uh, taste like uh, tea or green tea or something like that. And a lot of situations are now changing with regards to different uh, technologies, products and processes because the market is actually changing. There's no, uh, markets are not only a niche market, but there are a lot of multi-niche markets emerging from different parts of the world and different uh, situations in this, uh, in this social uh, world. Of course, at the end of the day, management has become what? From sharp distinction between the worker and the manager, the technology manager must understand that this has evolved into the overlap between the, the workers and the managers. Moreover, in this world, we are a network society. Social media is here. So just imagine the management is all virtual and collaborative. Uh, your boss might not be your boss. Your boss might be actually a robot or something like that. So that, that's the whole point. The business organization has changed its paradigm 
from the traditional emerging to the collaborative to the network and social society. Of course, these are the management transformation. The technology manager is actually faced with a lot of assumption. It could be an old assumption or a new assumption. Understanding the assumption of the management transformation is very important. The technology manager must understand if he is working in a closed system on our, on, or working with an open system where decisions in an old system are singular, new systems might be constrained, old assumption is that individual actions form the job, new assumption is that individual actions influenced by others, and basically at the end of the day, differentiation and specialization are old assumptions, but now at this day and age, you are what? Differentiated but coordinated with communication. So the technology manager is faced with a lot of management transformations. Now, these are the characteristics of the open and the closed system. Again, technology management is a part of this learning. You as a manager see that the open system, there are a lot of boundaries are changing, process are, problem solving are different this time, solutions are sometimes out of the, uh, more or less often outside the bounds of logic or sometimes they call it out of the box. And of course, there is some direct consciousness or efforts at stimulation of creative process to solve problems which are difficult. So this is an open system. A lot of companies have evolved their situations from close to open. And of course, the close companies where you see the boundaries are fixed, processes are marked by predictability, there's always a final solution, there's control, and there is a, often a probable logical correct sequence to understanding the problem. Procedures are known which directly aid problem solving could be algorithms or heuristics. So as a technology manager, you are poised or more or less, uh, you will be uh, armed with understanding the closed system and the open system. So as a technology manager, you must interface between this situation but because a lot of companies might still be in the closed system and a lot of companies now are moving into the open system.